Okay, so the topic of this video today are some of the various patterns that exist in evolution. So let's go ahead and get started. So let's jump right into something called divergent evolution. This is defined as when closely related species over time become increasingly different. You know, a great example that you're probably already familiar with, especially if you're in my class, are the finches, the Darwin finches on the Galapagos Islands. You might know that each island has a little different uh, habitats and, uh, and, and food for the finches to eat, and so they've all adapted uh, to eat various different kinds of foods, and you can see that in their beaks. Well, this is a great example of divergent evolution. Let's kind of trace them back in time here. So here's a picture of South America, and in the red box off the western coast of Ecuador, in the red box is the Galapagos Islands. And so it's believed that uh, here's a bunch of cartoonish birds uh, representing the ancestral finches. It's believed that a group of, of these finches arrived to the Galapagos Islands from the mainland of South America. Well, let's zoom on in. And so here we are looking at an overhead, kind of a satellite image of the Galapagos Islands here. And each finch eventually adapted to the differing environments on the islands. So as time passed, you imagine the finches reproduced, and then eventually some of them might fly elsewhere looking for better food and more food, better habitats to live. And, and so now a small group has arrived at this island. Well, over time, they're going to multiply, of course. And then as time passes, maybe a small group migrates over to this island. And as time passes, they're going to multiply. And every island is a little has some uniqueness to them. And as time passes, they start to acquire, uh, they start to take on the uh, characteristics and the adaptations to suit this particular environment. But as time passes, you imagine others uh, will migrate, and once they get to the new island, they multiply and reproduce, and they start to adapt to this particular island. And as time passes, again, this process continues. As time passes, some will migrate, and they'll start to reproduce, and they'll start to adapt to this island. And it's worth noting that today there are over thir uh, excuse me, there are 13 different species of Darwin finches on the various islands of the Galapagos. But it's really interesting to see how they've diverged from one original ancestor species back in the mainland of South America. Well, here's a neat little example. Here we have some cartoon squirrels, but these actually are representing real squirrels in, um, in the Grand Canyon area. So right now, we're going back in time here, when the Grand Canyon wasn't so grand, and right now there's gene flow between the northern squirrels, which would represent the left of the animation, and the southern squirrels, which would represent the right of the animation. But as time passes, eventually we have our Grand Canyon. Forces of erosion and the Colorado River carving and making the Grand Canyon what it is today. And right now, today, you can see that there's absolutely no gene flow between the squirrels on the left representing the northern side and on the right representing the southern side. And for instance, here we have two different species of squirrels. They've diverged over the years because they've been geographically isolated. There's been no gene flow between the squirrels in the northern rim and the squirrels in the southern rim because there's a physical barrier separating them. There's no gene flow and over time they've each adapted to their own unique environment great example here of divergent evolution. And so the pattern that we can kind of take from this is that species will adapt to the environment where they ultimately live and over time will begin to acquire any and adapt to the characteristics of that area. Well let's go ahead and switch the page here to convergent evolution. This is where different species over time will evolve similar traits because they live in a similar environment. Probably one of the more visual examples are these right here. You know, tuna representing fish, a dolphin representing mammals, and a penguin representing birds. Well, 
you think about what's in common between them is their environment. They're, these are all ocean organisms here, aquatic marine organisms here. And notice how they all have similar traits, even though they're very distantly related. Again, the tuna is a fish, the dolphin is a mammal, and the penguin is a bird. These are very, very different animals. And yet, because they live in the same environment, the ocean, whether you're a fish, a mammal, or a bird, it is an advantage to have a smooth, streamlined body with flippers to help you navigate through the ocean water. Notice how the appearance of these organisms is coming together. It's converging. Now, am I implying that sometime in the future, fish like tuna and dolphins and penguins will converge and become one species? Are they becoming the same species? And the answer is absolutely not. So kind of another fun example of convergent evolution would be, for instance, these critters right here, uh, flying squirrels. Well, you might know squirrels are, are in the rodent category, so they're in the same category as like mice and, and rats and, and other rodents. Well, another uh, organism called a sugar glider. When you first look at sugar gliders and flying squirrels, you would think, wow, these things are very closely related. They resemble one another. They each have little skin flaps in between their uh, their front legs and back legs for them to kind of glide and fly through the air. But the sugar gliders are marsupials, which if you know that word, that's the same category as kangaroos. So they're actually not very closely related at all, yet they have converged on this appearance because it helps them survive in their environment. And so kind of the, uh, the pattern here, the takeaway is this, is that if different species live in similar environments, they tend to develop the common features that would allow them to survive in that environment. So let's kind of move on to the next topic right here, co-evolution. Two or more species evolve in response to changes in one another. Kind of the classic example is what you kind of see right here. The relationship between birds, and like, like the hummingbirds in the picture, and the flowers. Notice the beaks on the hummingbirds kind of perched on the branches of those trees. See how long those hummingbird beaks are. Well, notice how there's the bird at the bottom that's feeding on a flower tube that's equally as long. And so the hummingbirds will, um, will benefit by getting food from the, uh, from the flowers. They will feed off of the nectar that's inside of the flower. Well, how does the flower benefit? The flower benefits by, by reproduction. As the, uh, the birds fly from flower to flower to flower, they spread pollen and allow the flowers to reproduce. Kind of a neat, kind of a classic example here of co-evolution. The two have evolved in response to one another. Kind of another fun example are, are what's called an evolutionary arms race. If you're familiar with the term an arms race, you might think of like the Cold War era United States versus the Soviet Union and uh, the, the back and forth that each country went through in order to build weaponry to defeat the other if there was ever a, a war between the two. But this is what's called an evolutionary arms race. You know, here is uh, the a, a kind of a complex pattern here of a, a murex snail shell. Notice all the the branchings and uh, and, and the the twisted shapes to it. Well, that helps to uh, prevent allow it to kind of survive crabs. Crabs will eat snails. Well, in order to adapt to this, notice how the crabs have evolved big, big pinchers to crack the shells. So they're kind of evolving back and forth uh, in, in an arms race in order to kind of survive the presence of the other. Kind of a neat little example there of co-evolution. But what it shows is kind of the pattern that the evolution of one species can affect others. So another pattern that we see in evolution is extinction. Life eventually, species will eventually die off and, and once they're gone, they're gone. Well, when it comes to extinction, let's talk about the background extinctions. These are the extinctions that are less severe. They tend to happen at a local level. It's not a global worldwide catastrophe. But for instance, maybe a forest fire starts in an area and as a result of the devastation from the forest fire, a species of plant might become extinct. 
But there's other reasons for these uh, what are called background extinctions. For instance, the dodo bird uh, went extinct when um, pigs and cats were introduced into the area where they used to live. Uh, the dodo bird was preyed upon. Same with this sea cow right here. It was hunted for its fur and uh, for the oil that you can get from its fat. And so, uh, unfortunately, due to predation, it, was, um, it, it became extinct. And the Tasmanian wolf. Uh, this went extinct because of competition. It was unable to compete with dogs that were introduced to its area where it used to live. So, but these are what we examples of background extinctions because despite their loss, the rest of the biodiversity in the area, the rest of, of the ecosystems were relatively unaffected. Well, then there's the mass extinctions. These are the, the severe global level extinction events that have occurred throughout Earth's history. There have been at least five mass extinctions that have occurred throughout history, the most recent one being about 65 million years ago. In the map, the little green area is what's called the Yucatan Peninsula off the coast of Mexico there. And that X kind of marks the spot where we believe a large impact occurred from outer space and when you see the this image here of the crater again this is under the surface of the ocean but you still see that there is a crater sized hole there um, that was left behind and we believe that that was the impact site that ended the uh, the the age of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago well, how do we know uh, that a, a mass extinction might have occurred? Well, normally when you're looking through the layers of rock, you know, randomly you'll find fossils here and there. But let's pretend this area of rock right here is 65 million year old rock. What we see are just a lot of fossils in that area of the rock. And then no more fossils in the younger areas. So clearly whatever that species is has gone extinct. Now, when we look at other uh, forms of life, again, you kind of see a random fossil here, a random fossil there, but then when you get to the 65 million year old rock, you just see a lot of fossils and then no more fossils in the younger layers, implying that that species is now extinct. And again, in the case of the dinosaurs, a random dinosaur fossil here, a random dinosaur fossil there, but when you look at 65 million year old rock, this is the time when the dinosaurs went extinct. We find a lot of dinosaur fossils and then no more fossils in the younger layers. So clearly some kind of mass extinction event happened here, especially when you look at 65 million year old rocks around the entire world and you see kind of the same pattern. You know, there are, there are many experts that would argue that humans are the cause of a sixth mass extinction uh, occurring right now. And you think of all the reasons for that. Well, one of the leading reasons would be deforestation and the destruction of natural habitats is causing life around the world to go extinct. Let's not forget the effects that climate change has, for instance, on the, uh, the coral reefs and the bleaching that they cause. The different varieties of not just water pollution, but also air pollution and all of these have had an impact over the past few decades that has caused a lot of life to go extinct. Well, let's kind of finish up on uh, the rate of evolution. You know, how fast does evolution occur? Well, there is no exact time frame. There's a couple patterns. After all, these notes are called patterns of evolution. So the first pattern is kind of the most common one, the pattern called gradualism, slow and steady change of one species over the time. For instance, um, here we have a horse. I mean, we're going to see small changes continually build. When we look at fossils millions of years ago, horses, uh, um, when we see their fossils and compare them to horses today, they're just incredibly smaller. Now, just to give you a little bit of context, if I put that horse on the surface next to the 60 million year old horse, you can see there's quite the size difference there. But horses have gradually evolved over the years to be what they are today. But we see slow and steady uh, changes, intermediate step by step by step until what we see today. That's in a great example right there of gradualism. 
Well, then there's another pattern called punctuated equilibrium. And this is the pattern of, uh, of rapid change, rapid evolution in a relatively short amount of time. Now, the pattern kind of goes like this. Over long periods of time, you see very little change. As you go up the rock layers, the shells that we're uncovering haven't really changed for long periods of time. But then if some sudden environmental change were to occur, in the next area you see some pretty dramatic changes in the shells. They go from pretty basic to uh, pretty elaborate. Where's all the in-between stages? Um, this would be a great example of punctuated equilibrium. And so as time passes, now these are the shelled life that we then see. But we see uh, long periods with little change and then a, a sudden rapid change. You know, one of the best things that could happen for mammals was the extinction of the dinosaurs. When dinosaurs went extinct, the diversity of mammals exploded to what we see today. Yeah, mammals were alive at the time of dinosaurs, but nothing like today. The mammals at the time of dinosaurs were small rodents uh, and, and maybe eat insects. But now that the biggest, baddest predators on the earth have been removed, the dinosaurs, we see the uh, diversity of mammals really take off to be what it is. And this has all happened in a relatively short amount of time. Kind of another good example of punctuated equilibrium. So uh, one thing to mention is that both uh, there are there's evidence to support both of these patterns. So it just depends upon the situation. Okay, so as we wrap up this video here, I want to leave you with a practice quiz to see if you are paying attention. And if you're in my biology class, I'm happy to check your answers before or after school one day. Thanks for watching.